In this video, we're gonna talk about the distance to vegetation and what that might mean for your decisions about the level of rating that you wanna achieve on your home should you be designing, building and renovating in a bushfire prone area. This video is part of our Rebuild and Build Better series. So be sure to like the video, subscribe to Undercover Architects YouTube channel and hit the bell so that you're always notified when a new video is published. Many homeowners are often surprised that their home has a bushfire overlay due to the distance to particular vegetation. And some other homeowners actually know that vegetation is close by that may have an impact during a bushfire and they wanna be able to build or renovate their home so that it can appropriately protect them and the home itself uh, during the event of a bushfire. So what do you need to know about these things? Well, we're gonna be diving into that in this video. Hello, I'm Amelia Lee from Undercover Architect and I help and teach homeowners how to get it right when designing, building and renovating their family homes. In this video, I speak with Jeff Dow from Ember Bushfire Consulting. Ember Bushfire Consulting are a team of qualified accredited professionals in the fire industry. And Jeff himself, as co-founder, has over 28 years experience as a professional in the fire industry. He shares a huge wealth of knowledge and information when it comes to understanding the impacts that a bushfire overlay can have on your property and how you need to navigate building and renovating in one of these types of areas. What's been your thoughts in terms of looking at distances to vegetation in areas that might not have necessarily bushfire overlays now? What, what are your, what's your sort of recommendation to people about looking at distances to vegetation and things like that and perhaps considering a different standard for their home? So 3959, um, uh, rightly or wrongly, stops at 100 metres. So where it says that you are within 100 metres of this unmanaged or classified vegetation, then you adopt the standard. Beyond that, it says that uh, effectively you'd be bow low. It's just saying that there, it's not saying that there's no risk. It's just saying that there's a low risk and it, it, it doesn't warrant any anything else. And that was done for... Um, uh, for, for a number of reasons, obviously, for, for cost. But um, through the work that uh, Justin Leonard has done, we, we can see that um, um, property destruction can happen. Certainly here in Duffy, it happened up to about 700 metres um, where there was uh, actual ember attack. Now, I'm not talking about spot fires. Spot fires are different things. We're talking about that, that um, shower of embers. There is a, a good argument for due diligence and just for looking after the asset to, to provide ember protection. I think ember protection, full stop, is just a really good thing to do for, for any Australian home. You've got um, some, some insulation benefits there. Uh, you've got the insect, uh, you know, that keep the, the, the critters out as well. Um, the, the, the generally, the ember mesh is the, the, you know, the very rigid type. So you've got security benefits there as well. It just makes sense. Um, so I would suggest uh, even if you're beyond that, it's just and, – and you've got scope within your, your budget, then I would say go for about 4.5. is just a really good fit um, for, for most Australian environments. Uh, even if you're in the city and, you, again, you're within, you know, three to 500 metres of, of, of bushland. We've got plenty of it here in Canberra. I live very close to, to Black Mountain. Uh, and it would be a very good fit for, for here. So those um, those things are really good. I, I just uh, will we'll pick up on a point as well. 3959 is uh, is is all about passive protection. Uh, you mentioned over and over and above or, or currently things that aren't captured by that. It's the minimum standard. Um, sprinklers are starting to come. The, the you know the uh, design, the development, the standards are getting better for that. Uh, I've seen firsthand um, the, the benefit that they can. They're tricky because then you have to get the timing right. I think where you've got um, town water supplies, then it just makes sense. Uh, and the, the, the sprinkler system not only applies to the, to, the, to the residents, to the structure, but also this asset protection zone. Let's keep the asset protection zone moist as well. So you're using that to, to really um, bolster the, the asset protection zone. Um, so I, I saw a, a property out at Carl Waller where it just worked perfectly and, and listening to some of the other practitioners in this most recent um, fires, uh, yeah, there's been many, many cases where sprinkler systems have been. The, 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 um, the, the critics of, of um, uh, sprinkler systems would say, well, you're going to have these high winds. It's not, it's not going to really uh, do exactly what it would do, which is what you'd see inside you know, a, a building it's a very controlled environment. Sprinklers work very well as a, um, a fire safety measure inside a building. It's a bit more dynamic, obviously, outside, a bit harder to control. We've got water supplies. So it does have to be thought out. But I, I think that's where we'll see some big improvements. 
is is with sprinkler systems uh, and and things like like bunkers as well. Yeah, the sprinkler systems is an interesting one. I was chatting about that with uh, an architect who was involved in the recovery after the Victoria 2009 fires and, you know, was involved in sort of the construction of temporary villages and things like that. And yeah. he actually mentioned how um, that he thought sprinklers would be a great solution. And at the moment, one of the challenges around them has been that a lot of them are manually operated yeah. so if you've had to evacuate your property and you haven't had the chance to turn them on prior um, or how yeah. they might be motorized as well whether it's with something that's combustible that that can be a challenge too and so he was sort of looking for some type of solution that they use in commercial properties where there's a heat sensor that then fires off the sprinkler system um, yes. to be able to be implemented in residential properties I saw actually a blog of a of a house that had a sprinkler system on it um, in the Canberra region that managed nice. to survive the fires but the sprinklers actually didn't get activated because he had to evacuate the property prior so oh. um, but the the property still withstood the fires because of a range of other solutions that they'd um, that they'd activated but that sprinkler one is an interesting one isn't it because you kind of feel well at least it would give you know winds aside all of those kinds of yeah. things at least I would give the property an additional layer of additional yeah. exactly Exactly, and I think there is a great benefit of it. There's lots of innovation that's starting to occur, you know, particularly where you've got a uh, connection to, you know, to the to, to the internet and whatnot. Um, there's some, uh, there's a fellow um, not far out of Goulburn. He's got systems that will actually trigger based on the FDI, but he's got he's also got remote um, trigger systems. What's the FDI? Um, oh well, so um, my understanding is that the system, sorry, the fire danger index. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about this earlier. Yeah. Um, what we tend to see the fire danger index is uh, is also related to the fire danger rating. Um, uh, FDI 100 is obviously near the catastrophic end of things. Um, severe kicks in about uh, FDI 50. Um, anyway, he's got this system that will set up uh, when the FDI reaches a certain number. It just comes on. Um, so there's much research that's been done uh, that indicates that we can get property loss at FDI 40 and above. Now, again, in giving you the scale, it's, it's zero to 100. Um, today, it's probably about FDI 15, 20 here in Canberra. Um, but in the more elevated um, uh, conditions, it gets right up to 100. Um, the point was he had this uh, sprinkler system set up so that it just triggered when it got to within that range where you can get destructive fires and it, it just ran. It didn't matter. Um, and, and obviously, he had to top up his water supply or whatever, but it was, it was on the go. So... Yeah, the, the the point is that there's many innovate, and I, I we're going to see more and more. And I think this is the positives to such events is that we see great innovation, we see great ideas coming forward, uh, and I, I would suspect that we'll see more and demand as well. As you said, let's not just go for the baseline. Give me more, give me more, and and it's out there, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic. And it, it is, it's really exciting as we start to see how much more automation we can put into our homes yeah. and the things that we can access remotely to be able to protect yourself, your family, you know, take what you can and then trust the care of your property to the systems that you've put in place, the protection nice. mechanisms that you've created a, around the property and the access that you yeah. can provide the RFS to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, then I think that, yeah, they're, they're much they're much better solutions than you standing there. So there were so many stories of people staying to defend their properties and putting their own lives in huge amounts of risk um, as a result. And you can understand, you know, when you've lived in a home and you've got not only a financial investment there, but a significant emotional attachment, yes, why people yes. stay. And some people, they just left it too late. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, I think it would be fantastic to see these innovations come through that enable us to manage risk around people needing to stay and take care of their properties um, and yeah. instead being able to, to leave. And the challenging thing is that a lot of the properties that are in these areas that were affected were built prior to any of this legislation coming in. So the, I feel like there's going to be this great big kind of shift as all of construction kind of catches up with yes. the current legislation and then as, yeah. a, as a kind of community and a population, we're perhaps better 
um, in a better position to manage these types of situations in the future. So. Did you find that helpful? I so hope that you did. Make sure that you check out the description below. We've got lots of extra information to help and support you as you build or renovate your home. There's also a full transcript available of this interview and the link is in the descriptions below. Now, be sure to like the video, subscribe to Undercover Architects YouTube channel and hit the bell so that you're notified every time a new video is published. And you can be sure to check out these videos as well because we've got lots of extra information to share with you that's going to be super helpful. As always, thank you for tuning in and for letting me be your secret ally. Until next time, bye.